Hello, hello. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Simporton Conversations at SD State, brought to you by the College of Nursing Healthcare Simulation Center at South Dakota State University. My name is Patrick Burley, and I serve as an instructor here within our Sioux Falls site. And I will be hosting the podcast episodes um, throughout this series. Um, the team and I um, have been thinking of innovative ways to provide some levity during our sessions um, and to, to consider ways in which we can incorporate the term SIM throughout our sessions. And so uh, moving forward, my official title will be um, Master of Cimarronis, uh, of course, uh, uh, in reference to Master of Ceremonies. So we hope that um, you find those references refreshing. Uh, so today we have, of course, our very first episode, as I mentioned, and that episode is entitled Introduction to New Healthcare Simulation Standards of Best Practice. These are 10 standards that were published in the Clinical Simulation and Nursing uh, back in September of 2021 by the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning Standards Committee. Today's panel includes a number of faculty throughout a couple of our different sites within the College of Nursing, and I will allow them an opportunity to introduce themselves at this time. Hi, hey, I'm Dr. Alyssa Zweifel, Assistant Professor at the Sioux Falls site, and I serve as the Healthcare Simulation Center Director. Hi, my name is Allison Stromer. I'm a nursing instructor with the College of Nursing in Rapid City, South Dakota, and I'm one of the dedicated simulationists at that site. Hello, I am Takara Schomburg. I am one of the instructors here at our Sioux Falls site, um, and I serve as our simulation site coordinator for Sioux Falls. Okay, so as we had mentioned, um, this first episode, um, we're going to be really unpacking and looking at each one of the 10 standards um, for simulation and the, um, the panel here will be discussing and elaborating on each of those and, and what that means. So for each standard, there's a few things that we want to look at and make sure to clarify and, and the first, of course, is simply describing or defining that standard um, and what looking at what that standard means. Um, and then looking at what have we been doing here within the College of Nursing to meet that standard already? Um, because of course we've already in the past been doing some really neat things to support our achievement of these standards, but then also looking forward into what are the innovations that we're going to be incorporating uh, moving forward to, to better support our, our uh, standard achievement. But for our first standard, we're looking at professional development. And Takara, would you mind taking that one? Absolutely. Um, so professional development is actually a new standard of best practice um, released with this group in, in September. Um, in the beginning of simulation, you know, a lot of the training and education had been conducted primarily through the equipment and software manufacturers. Um, here at, um, at SD State, we held a strong standard of, of training our simulationists um, with the Washington SIM modules and making sure they had a good solid understanding of simulation as an education modality um, and our best practices in following the um, standards of debriefing. Um, but the new standards really call us to you know, step that up. Um, it's important first to note that this uh, standard references professional development as opposed to faculty development. And that's really to encapsulate uh, the many roles that a simulationist may have, um, whether that's an administrator or researcher, a technical specialist, a facilitator, and so forth and so on. Um, but then the standard asks that each of us then is identifying areas that we need to grow in um, and engaging in activities that will help us meet our goals, uh, fulfill our roles, and really align ourselves with the institutional priorities. Then as a SIM Center, we're uh, working to assess the educational needs of our faculty. We're working on um, providing some of those learning opportunities and putting into plan um, reevaluation of that. Um, and so that's actually what brings us to this podcast today. This is one of our, our big initiatives um, to meet this standard. We're rolling out this podcast. We're going to have monthly um, educational sessions for our simulationists to attend. Um, 
we have we're going to have some um, journal presentations at our monthly meetings. Um, we just have a lot going on um, to meet this new standard. It's really exciting for us. Yeah, thank you, Takara. So I think one of the challenges that we face often with with nursing students is really getting them to appreciate simulation as a really um, important strategy, right? Because they always, it's kind of this narrative of simulation isn't real. This isn't that important. Um, it's not as beneficial as, as working with a real patient in a real hospital. And I think one of the ways that we overcome that barrier is by making sure that the simulation facilitators themselves appreciate the important role that it plays. Um, so that we can we can showcase that for students and get their buy-in. Absolutely, I think that a lot of our efforts will do a lot to bolster our team um, and really fuel even more innovation within our simulation center. Yeah, great. Right. I love that this new standard really brings out that individual piece. We're setting individual outcomes and goals related to professional development along with our program objectives. So. Yeah, I agree, Alyssa. I think it really challenges us to invest not just in the program, but in the ind individual facilitators themselves. Yeah, I think about how, um, you know, in my limited training within simulation, I recall the computer modules that you completed. And to me, it was very akin to kind of the um, mandatory training that you completed any job for like an active shooter or sexual harassment, right? It's this sort of very repetitive, monotonous thing that you need to do to check off your checklist. And the, what, what the College of Nursing, of course, is doing is trying to really move beyond just that obligatory training module you complete. But this is actually something that calls for continuing professional development, um, continued research and, and learning um, lifelong for, for faculty. Absolutely. All right, wonderful. So, so I think the, the next um, standard that we'll look at then is pre-briefing. Um, and Dr. Zweifel, would you mind taking um, that one? Sure, yes. Pre-briefing is actually a new standard that came out in 2021. This really helps ensure learners are prepared prior to the simulation activity. So all of the pre-briefing comes prior to. It can be very different for each simulation, but really what we want to establish is that psychological safe learning environment for all the students and participants that will be in that activity. So some of the pre-briefing might include background information. Most of our students do some type of prep related to the specific topic, whether it's reading in their textbook, looking at a specific diagnosis, maybe looking up medications, that all comes in that prep work. Some of our simulations have then a quiz just to enhance that piece of, did the students really do their prep work? What is their pre-knowledge coming into the simulation? And then the rest of pre-briefing really is that reviewing our objectives for the simulation, instructions for the day, describing roles and guidelines that our students would play, and then giving that initial nursing report so they have a starting point. The other really important part that we need to incorporate into that pre-briefing is orientating to the equipment. So we have a lot of different equipment here at SD State. Depending on the simulation, we we'll use different equipment. So when students start in that pre-briefing pre phase, we need to remind them, show them, and give them that quick brief orientation so that they know what to expect from the simulated environment and what they can and can't do for that, for that patient during that simulation. Good, thank you, Alyssa. So, you know, I know that this is a discussion specific to simulation, but I think about as I hear you talking, um, how a lot of the points that you make are really relatable to um, different types of pedagogy outside of the simulation lab even. And so um, I think about even in the classroom or at a clinical rotation, the importance of having that initial um, interaction with the students to not only 
discuss the logistic pieces that you mentioned, like the tech, the different pieces of technology and such, but also just to set expectations um, for the students. So as you mentioned, so that they know what to expect and, um, and, and let them know what your expectations are of them as well. Right, and the other important part is, depending on the student's level, it changes how much prep they do and how much pre-briefing they get. So our first semester students, we do a lot more detailed on those pieces where a fifth semester student should, should have the ability to jump in to a scenario and take care of a patient with, with less prep and less report. So we stage all of our simulations related to the learning level too. Well, and that's an inherent benefit with simulation, right? That you don't get with your, your more traditional clinical rotation. You can't uniquely tailor the complexity or the acuity of a patient necessarily to the learner level. Um, and of course, with simulation, you're able to um, control some of those variables much more effectively than you would um, to best support their success and their learning. So I think that's always, as we look at, you know, why do we care about simulation and, and why is it considered so valuable, um, that represents one of, of a menu of, of many different benefits, I would say. Um, all right, so so we talked about pre-briefing then. So of course, that's kind of before the simulation session, right? Now we're gonna look at um, inter-simulation, if you will, or what's happening during that um, simulation experience um, with the facilitation standard. Allison, would you mind taking that one? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. So when we talk about facilitation of simulation, we're really thinking about the implementation and, and carrying out those activities and helping the learning, the learners to meet their learning outcomes. And so uh, the, the facilitator is the person who helps the students and guides them through some of those processes. And so uh, we're really working to support teamwork among the participants. There's a variety of learning outcomes very specific to each simulation that help them to do that. And so one of the things we look at is teamwork among participants. Uh, we want to make sure that we're helping the students to understand learning outcomes. So before we start a simulation, before we give any sort of context or background to the specific sim, we go through learning outcomes with the students, with the learners, helping them to understand where are we trying to get with the simulation for that particular day. Um, and then plan development to, to meet outcomes as well. That's another role that a facilitator would take on. Uh, so we guide learners through those processes as facilitators of simulation. Um, we certainly, as our professional role, when we talk about professional development, we speak back to some of the things that Takara spoke to in relationship to that pursuit of continu continuing education related to simulation-based experiences and, and the process. Um, and then certainly something else that we're expected to do is seek assessment from, um, you know, maybe from uh, Dr. Zweifel. She will come and watch us do uh, a simulation, carry out a simulation as a facilitator and give us feedback in relationship to uh, where, where can we work to improve our practice a little bit? Where can we help students to, to meet outcomes in a more meaningful manner? And then of, certainly that identification of goals that we all have is a new process that we're coming to and uh, coming to recognize with these new standards. Um, so a part of our role in the simulation itself, as you said, that intra simulation piece, when we talk about pre-brief and debrief in the simulation itself, we're really trying to help to support development of learner skills, uh, including things like critical thinking, clinical judgment, and really getting that application piece of knowledge that they gain in a theory course uh, in, into a practical setting. And we mentioned earlier in this conversation about uh, you know, students recognizing the value of simulation as a valid and reliable way to interact with a patient, quote unquote, uh, that is, is maybe a standardized patient that's maybe an actor and has lines to carry out or with mannequin. Uh, so that's that's a part of uh, what the facilitators were do. And um, as we've mentioned already to this point, you know, that initial education using educational modules that we all have sort of that springboard into what simulation is. We all do that to make sure we have that initial start um, and recognizing that the skill set is quite extensive. And as our professional development uh, continues on based on these new standards, I'm sure there will be more and more things that come out in our standards to help us to, to make sure that we're meeting those things. Uh, Dr. Zweifel talked about preparation activities like prep work and quizzes, and it's very dependent on student level. 
Uh, we always talk about discussion of ground rules and, you know, give the students a description of the simulation based experience uh, and help them to remember that, you know, this is a safe space to um, make mistakes, to learn from those mistakes. And then we give them that opportunity in, um, with our debriefing model. We'll talk about that here shortly uh, to help them learn about what's going on and what is their thought process in that reflective debrief. Um, certainly, it's important for a facilitator to help to man maintain the integrity of the simulation, uh, to, to, you know, let things to unfold. If we think about what would happen in an actual clinical setting, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we're helping students to get into the simulation and recognize that they should be treating this as, as an actual clinical scenario. Um, but then also potentially, you know, if we had to uh, maybe add some prompting to help to make sure that we're going down the correct path in order to meet our learning outcomes as well. Yeah, thank you, Allison. Um, so, so the role of the facilitator is much more complex than just operating a computer or providing a, a voice for a patient, right? And I think that right. um, I think that oftentimes, even among um, nursing faculty that don't have some of this training and professional development, that's even a misconception. A lot, it, I think it sometimes is perceived as a lot more of a rudimentary task than it really is much more should be much more sophisticated and, and um, multi dimensional role. Yes, very much so. And and speaking as a faculty that is very involved in facilitation, you're very much paying attention to what the students are doing in the simulation. There might also be um, potentially like management of observers. So it's not just making sure that the learners who are actually going to engage in the simulation have what they need. It's also guiding observers to focus on things that are going well, communication that they saw. How did the actual learners in the simulation meet learning outcomes, where is there room for improvement to everybody, for everybody to improve their practice? Yeah, great. Thank you, Allison. So, so as I mentioned, we, we looked at pre-briefing, then we looked at facilitation with Allison, and so then we moved to sort of the third part of this, right, which is post-simulation or that debriefing session. And of course, um, I think many people appreciate the importance of debriefing, whether that's in simulation or in a clinical experience, um, or even in a, you know, a, a, a real life code situation, right? And, and talking about how the learning really is, the best learning is occurring during that debrief, right? So Takara, would you mind um, discussing that debriefing component, please? Absolutely, I think you, you set it up well, uh, Patrick, that debriefing is where, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting of learning happens with simulation. Um, there is often this idea with students that it's in the hands-on, it's in the, the starting of lines and in the assessing of the patient, which is certainly important. But what we find um, often <laughs> is when they're in that scenario, they have such um, high feelings and high anxiety that sometimes, um, you know, the um, critical thinking parts, the nursing process parts um, are maybe not as, as well engaged at, in the moment. So debriefing offers us that chance to take a step back um, and really analyze what has happened in the simulation scenario itself. Um, we obviously hearken back to the objectives of the simulation and, and the information covered in the pre-brief. Um, we have opportunities for both the um, observers and our uh, participants, our active participants, to reflect on you know, things that maybe um, were challenging for them or they got stuck on. We asked them to critically think about how they made their decisions uh, throughout the simulation. Um, and, you know, we, as we're preparing nurses to go into practice, that's the parts we really need to have them um, considering. Why did they choose this medication versus that medication? Why did you, you know, choose to say it that way? Um, but one of the really rewarding parts of debriefing um, is, is the way we um, utilize our good judgment model. So um, the standard of debriefing requires us to ensure that debriefing is incorporated um, into our, our simulation-based activities. It's um, consciously constructed, designed, facilitated by someone who's competent in debriefing. And you know, as we spoke earlier, we um, certainly have that standard present in our program. Um, it's gonna promote self, team, and or systems analysis while they're reflecting on, on how the uh, session unfolded, and then it's gonna be planned and structured. It's gonna be purposeful in the way it happens. It's gonna have 
you know, solid pedagogy and theoretical frameworks that are framing it. So here at, at SD State, um, we use what's called the good judgment model, uh, where what we're really seeking to have our learners do um, is analyze the actions that occurred and analyze that critical thinking. So we, um, you'll see it really akin to that adult learning theory, um, where we're asking them to consider what frame or reference they were using um, while making their decisions. And then we kind of walk them through ways they might shift that frame um, to understand it differently. Um, saying, I wonder if this piece, did you, you know, I wonder if you considered um, this aspect um, or if this were to be true, how would that have changed um, your decision-making process? Um, so I asked them to really think through the, the why and the how and not just the fact that it happened. Um, it also is something, our, our goal is to have those learners giving one another um, that feedback and, and having that bi-directional feedback where they're um, asking one another these questions or challenging one another's per perceptions, um, maybe making observations about something they saw. And it, it's not really a judgment-based, you know, right or wrong, uh, but rather I noticed this, um, would it, how might it have played out if we did it in this order instead? Um, and having this safe place for them to ask those questions and ponder these thoughts and think about um, what it's like to really be in that nursing role. And that's what a lot of them reflect on too, is the difference between, you know, being in the nursing role in a simulation setting, whereas at clinical, they're in the nursing student role um, and not necessarily responsible for making those, those high level decisions in the moment. Yeah, thank just you. To, oh, oh, no, ahead, Patrick. no, please. I was just going to, sorry about that, dovetail off what was Takara was saying about, you know, um, with the debriefing process, and then it just kind of fits very nicely talking, just have talking about the, the facilitator process as well, because the facilitator is really meant to be the guide through the conversation. You know, as a facilitator, it's not our role to, uh, to stand up and talk about content and deliver content. And, and it's really the idea to get the students to reflect and bounce ideas off of each other and just to sort of ask maybe some of those more prompting questions, you know, as Takara was saying, like, oh, I observed that. How would that have changed if, you know, just to get them to, to kind of thinking about some of those things. And uh, students have come to know that we will always ask them to talk about how they feel right after the simulation. Takara has a wonderful feeling wheel that's very colorful and it has all these different emotions on it. And uh, it takes some time for students to get comfortable with sort of analyzing and identifying how do I feel after that simulation. But as you can imagine, some of our simulations are maybe less emotionally charged, but then certainly there are others of them that do bring out feelings that students maybe didn't even recognize they had until they were really asked to identify them. I think Allison, you know, with that, um, one of the important parts of that feelings reflection is the chance to think about how their feelings might have impacted um, the care provided. You know, so if they identify that they were highly anxious um, or a particular thing, you know, triggered a, a high emotional state, um, that that perhaps altered the way they communicated or altered the way they made their decisions from there on out. And so then we have the opportunity to once again, um, walk them through um, kind of uh, troubleshoot what to do when those things happen, you know, kind of letting them know that it is normal to have feelings uh, when you're giving care and you will have, you know, high feeling situations in your, your clinical practice as well. Um, but how can we gain those skills to, to process those feelings and still give excellent care to our patients? Oh, and I wanted to highlight as well, Patrick, that um, debriefing is one of our standards that our um, simulationists have really highlighted as something they would like to continue to grow in. So it's interesting to me, that's one of the, the standards I think that our, our program has been so good about pursuing education for, but it's the one that we continue to really want to, be, to excel in. Um, I think because it has such an impact on, you know, the learning that the students walk away with. Um, so we're going to have a number of um, educational opportunities coming up this year to talk more about debriefing and um, thinking about how we structure our questions and walk them through those different steps, finding some of the gaps where we could really um, improve upon um, to make our debriefing all the more meaningful. 
Yeah, I I think about how, you know, a buzz term that I hear a lot is reflective practice, right? And and we always tell students how important that is, but sometimes I feel like we kind of miss the mark in terms of um, really explaining what reflective practice is and then role modeling that for them as well. Um, you know, even in some of our um, classroom activities and clinical activities, we're having them complete journal reflections and such. And I think all too often those activities are really judged by students to be kind of busy work or fluff. Um, and so how are we presenting these experiences, these debrief sessions, um, and, and again, role modeling that, that idea that really you should be debriefing um, every shift that you work, right? Maybe it's not in a formal structured setting with a nursing instructor and a group of your peers necessarily, um, but this is something that really promotes your lifelong learning and growth as a nurse. Um, and so I think, just like you say, to really plant that seed during their um, nursing education is really important. Um, so, so the next um, standard then that we'll talk about here is simulation design. Um, and then Alyssa, if you wouldn't mind um, discussing simulation design. Sure, yep. So simulation design standard really gives us that structure and process that incorporates identified objectives and expected outcomes for our specific simulation activity, but it also incorporates our missions and values from our healthcare simulation center. So when we look at simulation design, it's really important that as a simulationist, we also identify the content expert when we're designing a simulation. So for example, if we're looking at an OB simulation, you know, me as a simulationist, I don't have OB experience. So I should seek the, the experts in the field to make sure that I'm following best practice for that content. But then I can be the person that makes sure we're following the simulation healthcare standards and best practice. So we always do a needs assessment, look at our supportive objectives, and then really think about who are we creating the simulation for? We want to make sure it's adapted to the level of the learner. And then looking at different ways of using fidelity, using that guided reflection and the debriefing process that we just talked about. And then it's very important when simulation design is created that we pilot that activity. So here at SDSU, we have a committee that pilots typically twice a year. We do a, a larger event um, in May and then in August, and we pilot three to four simulations that we've been working on throughout the year to see how it's ran. We incorporate different experts and simulationists from each site, and then we give feedback and make adjustments before we put it into our curriculum. We also have done task force like in the summer months when we don't have as many students on site to really design and create some of our simulation activities. Thank you, Alyssa. So, so when you use the term simulationist, uh, just to clarify for anyone who maybe isn't familiar with that term, would a simulationist be, you know, any one who is involved in the simulation, including the debriefer, including a facilitator? Yeah, so when we say this, the term simulationist is anybody that is active in creating and running the simulation activity. So it's the instructor that's maybe playing the role of, this, of the facilitator, the simulation technologist or operation specialist that's running the computer. It might also incorporate somebody that's playing um, a standardized patient role. So. It's a pretty broad term, but yes, it's anybody that is involved with that creation and running that activity of that simulation experience. I see. Thank you. So simulation, as you mentioned, is defined quite broadly. All right. Well, that's going to wrap us up for our very first um, episode of Simportant Conversations at SD State. Um, just as a recap, in, in this session and this episode, we have provided a brief introduction to the first five um, standards, which again, were pre-briefing, facilitation, debriefing, 
um, simulation design, and then, um, forgive me, professional development was the very first one we had discussed. Um, and so in our, our subsequent episode, we'll discuss the second set of five um, simulation standards, which will include operations, outcomes, objectives, professional integrity, simulation enhanced interprofessional education, and then finally evaluation of learning performance. And so we're really looking forward to providing that introduction and, and unpacking those, those next five um, standards so that in subsequent episodes, then we can do a deeper dive into each one of them um, and look at them each in a more granular level of detail. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining our uh, session today. I um, have been um, very pleased and delighted to be part of this opportunity. So I hope that everyone has a fantastic uh, day or afternoon whenever you're watching this. And we look forward to seeing you on the second episode of Simport and Conversations at SP State. Take care. <laughs>